All right, Exodus 37. Going chapter by chapter, verse by verse, working our way through the Word. We're at Exodus 37. We might make it to, uh, you know, Leviticus by January at this rate. Let's, let's find out. You know, I've been, I've been moving kind of two chapters at a time, but I'm not tonight. Tonight, it's a, it's a one-chapter deal. Uh, really a cool chapter, too. Uh, and all you, see, all you see at the beginning of this is, is the beginning of the work of the ark. Like they're starting. They're starting the work of the tabernacle. And Moses has got all this information from God on top of the mountain. He's 40 days, chaos, golden calf, whoops. Uh, you know, grind it down, make them drink it. 3,000 die at the hands of the Levites. Back up on the mountain, talking to God. God's saying, I'm not even going to take another step with you guys because I might kill you. He's talking to God. God says, okay, I'm going to go with you, but you better, you know, let's just strip off all of the jewelry. Be ready to move correctly. What you did was really, really a big mistake. So now the people are kind of in mourning. He goes back up. He spends 40 days, and they wait patiently this time for the next 40 days. Then he comes down, and they just, just they, they are so repentant that they're just pouring out all of these things that they've been carrying since Egypt. All the things that they looted from Egypt. All this pagan gold is going to make God's tabernacle. He's going to make it all holy. Do the same thing with it that he does with us. Take what's not holy and make it holy. Take what was dedicated to the world and make it dedicated to him. And make it a touch point for him. So a place where, you know, heaven touches earth and you get to worship God because of how he altered what, the very fabric of what's being used. So it starts here. And interestingly also, God tells Moses there is a man who is full of the Spirit of God. I have picked him specifically. His name is Bezalel. And there's, I've also given my spirit to another one, Ohaliab. And these two have the gift to teach others, but they also have the gift to work with metallurgy. They can do gold. They can do silver. They can do casting of any kind of metal, bronze. They can they can embroider. They can do any kind of fabric. They can they can do it all. Actually, any kind of any kind of decoration, any kind of ornate thing that I want put in this temple, they can do. And if they if they don't have time to do it, they will they will teach others to do it. So that's what's happening. And that's where we are. And you're beginning with Bezalel. And, and, and after the last chapter where everybody just pours out so much offering, the last couple of chapters, that, they're, that they have to stop their work and say, stop. Thank you. That's enough. We have more than enough to do the work. We have to keep stopping our work to receive more offerings. And, and that, like, that's, that's the attitude right now. It's amazing. So a quick word of prayer. Lord Jesus as we engage with your word, I just ask, Father, you engage with us. Uh, we want to so much hear from you and have something to take with us. It's not just, it's never just a history lesson. What we're after is to commune with you, to worship you in your word, and to have you affect us, God, touch point between you and us and your spirit inside of us just welling up as your word is pronounced, Lord changing things inside of us, making us more like you as we behold you more. We're asking for this in your name, Jesus. Amen. So it reads like this. Starts with the ark. Bezalel made the ark of acacia wood, two and a half cubits long, a cubit and a half wide, and a cubit and a half high. And I almost forgot. The title actually matters tonight. So called to build. Called to build. We... As a people, we're called to build. We're called to build things that weren't there before. Like they're on a desert floor, and then there's going to be a tabernacle. And we're called to build, but we're called to build specific ways. And there's certain things that are going to be really, um, uh, there's just trademarks of things that the people of God build that should be there. And they're going to be here, and they should be in what the people of God build now, today. So we're called to build, but in the beginning, the very first thing that we're called to build, we're called to build holy things. We're called to build tools of worship. And that's what Bezalel's doing right now. He's building actual tools of worship that the people are going to use to communicate with God. God's going to live there. So that's the first thing, just just 
called to build tools of worship. So now, Bezalel made the ark, which is going to go in the most holy place, of acacia wood. Two and a half cubits long, a cubit and a half wide, and a cubit and a half high. He overlaid it with pure gold, both inside and out, and he made a gold molding around it. He cast four gold rings for it, and he fastened them to its four feet, with two rings on one side, two rings on the other side, and then he made poles of acacia wood, and he overlaid them with gold. These are for carrying the ark. When you slide them through those poles, you're not supposed to touch it. And he inserted the poles into the rings on the side of the ark to carry it. He made the atonement cover of pure gold, two and a half cubits long and a cubit and a half wide. And then he made two cherubim out of hammered gold, two power angels representative of what was in heaven. Then he made two cherubim out of hammered gold at the ends of the cover, each end looking. He made one cherub on one end and the second cherub on the other. At the two ends, he made them of one piece with the cover. The cherubim had their wings spread upward, overshadowing the cover with them. The cherubim faced each other and they looked toward the cover, toward the mercy seat where the blood will be smeared once a year. I got to stop here. So there's something going on that's super significant here. We're called to build holy things. Right now, we, we know this. We know this about the ark. No touchy. Don't touch the ark. Seventy elders touched that thing when they got it back from the Philistines. They all died. Uh, the, um, Uzzah is walking with David as it's on its way back to Jerusalem. And they're all celebrating. And they got it on a cart with oxen. They're doing everything wrong. There's no poles. There's, they're not carrying it the correct way. They just got a cart. If the oxen stumble. He puts a hand out. Whoosh, he just drops down dead. We know that Nadab and Abihu... Aaron's sons, the first two extra priests that go into these holy places, they go in with some unauthorized fire. I don't know what they were doing, but they're messing around with the incense in the holy place, and that's a big-time no-no, and they get fried. Like, you don't play around in the holy place or the most holy place. In that place where God's presence is, you don't go in there flippantly. You go in to worship. And so when you don't, bad things happen. It's always that way. When the Philistines cracked the thing open to see what was inside, they got tumors, hemorrhoid tumors. They made molds of them. Don't really want to know exactly how they made those molds, but they did make molds of them and put them back in the thing and sent it back. They made molds of rats because rats came through town and gave them this plague. And all the five uh, biggest cities of the Philistines were just dying of this plague rapidly because they had opened the ark flippantly to look inside. Oh, what's this holy artifact? They didn't care. You don't, you don't approach things of God flippantly. Even now. Even with the Holy Spirit living inside us, we should not treat him flippantly. Like, yeah, well, maybe I'll spend some time with you today, God. Kind of half listening to a message. We, we should really, we're not going to get fried for it because we live in a new, you know, we live in a, in a new era with, with God's grace. But come reverently. Come reverently to the king. And every time you approach his word, approach it reverently. When you crack open that, that ark, that Bible, God's presence is there. God's presence inside of you is like deep is calling to deep. You want to know more. Your, your heart should be desiring it. If it isn't, keep reading it until it does. But don't approach it flippantly. Like it doesn't really matter. And here's what's strange about this. Bezalel has the Spirit of God in him. God says to Moses, I put my Spirit in him to do this. So he goes in and he starts creating, making the ark. He can touch it. He's working on it. He's got, the, he's got the lid. He'll look inside to make sure he did everything right. He's putting the rings on the side. He's fastening them on. He's doing the acacia wood. He's making sure everything's good and stable. He's touching it constantly. He's looking inside of it. He's completely unhurt. Nothing happens to him. Nothing bad. He's doing exactly what he's supposed to do, intimately working uh, building the ark because right now the spirit of God's in him and he can do this just like we can as New Testament believers we could come up to the ark we could come up to the most holy place the most holy place actually came to us 
God ripped the curtain in half and the Holy Spirit went and we all have access to it. Anyone that's a believer. But, but Bezalel's a New Testament kind of guy. He's got the Spirit of God inside of him and he can work with us. Just like Moses, anyone else can only go into the most holy place once a year and he just walks in and out of there and talk to God all the time. So here, here's Bezalel and he's working to create this ark He's making a holy thing, but the holy thing isn't yet. Once that, once that becomes what it's supposed to be, he will be in as much danger as anybody else to walk up and touch it. Yeah. To walk up and look inside. Now he can't. It's what it's supposed to be in its proper place, and now that's a priest's job, not the craftsman. But right now it's his job to build it. Once he's done, no, because the Spirit of God's going to be in that ark. It's not, it's not going to be just free access anymore. But right now, it's supposed to. It's not what it is. It's not, it's not that holy artifact yet. It's just a bunch of Egyptian gold, a bunch of Egyptian acacia wood. It's a bunch of Egyptian materials that are being turned into something holy. But once they are, once this holy thing is constructed, now it's not to be toyed with. This is this not a play thing. And so there's another piece of this that I think is just fascinating. We're called to build with the types of materials that he's using. Like in 1 Corinthians 3, 12 through 16, it reads like this. By the grace God has given me, Paul speaking, he's writing this from jail, by the way, where we are in Acts. Where we are on Sundays in Acts, where he's sitting underneath Felix for two years in jail and then under Festus for two more, well, for, for longer until he gets sent to Rome. While he's sitting there in jail, he's writing to the Corinthians. He's already started his work of the New Testament without even knowing he's doing it. And this is from that section. By the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as a wise builder. And someone else is building on it. Each one should build with care. For no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. If anyone builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, which is all the stuff he's using, wood or hay or straw, their work will be shown for what it is because the day will bring it to light. It'll be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each person's work. If what has been built survives, the builder will receive a reward. If it's burned up, the builder will suffer loss, but yet will be saved even though only as one escaping through the flames. The people of God are called to build, and we're called to build holy things. This was a bowling alley. It's now a place where God's people meet to worship God. The church I went to in Florida was a bank. It was then a church. The other church that I went to in Florida was a Walmart, and then it was a 4,000-member church that worshiped God, which it still is today. That was from a pastor who had a 20-person home fellowship that was the same pastor when it was at Walmart. God just went, pow! He just did something. He was called to build. He was called to build. God sent him to St. Pete and told him to build. And he used gold. He used costly stones. It wasn't wood, hand, stubble. But here's the thing. The day will bring it to light. There's going to come a time where there will be a major challenge to every work of God. And it will be, and, and it'll come with fire. And it will test the quality of the work. We've experienced that this past year, have we not? The work was tested. The work was tested with fire. The fire came and tried to consume the work. And we passed that test. And here we are, worshiping God and strengthening and growing. But the, the fire will always come to test the work. And if you've been building with wood, haze, if you've been building with inferior ingredients, if you haven't been disciple-making, if you haven't been working on unity in your church, if you haven't been trying to get anything established that draws everybody closer to God, if you haven't been operating in love, if you've been operating in, 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 in backbiting or, or um, name-calling or within the body, if you've been, uh, the fire will burn that up. 
But what will remain is what God wants to remain. And when it remains, it'll remain strong. And God can build from that. The fire will always come and test. So we have to build things that have the intent to last. We're called to build things. That's, that's the second point. We're called to build holy things, but we're called to build things that will last. You want to know how long they use this? 480 years they will use this tabernacle in its shape that they built it in, that this group built it in, before they settle in the promised land. Then they will use it again for another 370 years. It's going to be almost a thousand years that these articles are used in the temple. Tabernacle and then Solomon's temple. And they'll keep being used. But they, when Nebuchadnezzar comes in in 587 B.C. and wipes the whole thing out, that's when the ark got lost. That's almost 900 years after Bezalel made it. And it stood the test of a lot of time. A lot of people still think it exists somewhere, but just not sure where the thing is. Either way, it was built to last. It lasted a long time. God's kingdom is built to last. It'll take on fire and things will happen, but the fire will only build the growth. It'll, it'll be like after a volcano. You'll see an island after a volcano. And it just, it's all this rich, fertile soil and it comes back to life vibrant. The thing, any, any seeds that land in that grow crazy fast. And these, and, these, and these tropical islands just go boom because of the vibrant soil. God does the same thing. We're called to build holy things. We're called to build things that will last. We're called to build by faith. We're called to walk by it. We're called to build by it. If you're Bezalel and God says to you, okay, if Moses says to God and then Moses says to you, so basically God's saying to you, here's what I need. You know, four feet by two, four, four cubits by two cubits, da, 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 da. That box, okay, I get that, rectangle. Now I need two angels that look exactly like they do in heaven because you're making an exact copy of what's in heaven. So I need it done right, Bezalel. So two cherubs, they're mighty powerful angels, and they're going to be on both sides of this mercy seat, which he doesn't know yet is going to represent Christ. So all of that is all one piece on the lid. You lift up the lid, you lift up the cherubim. Their, their wings, wait, I've never seen an angel, is what he's probably thinking. And I've never seen a power angel. You know, are they, are they like Pokemon? There's like little ones and big ones. And, you know, I don't know, like, what, what, what does an angel look like? How, how do I create this God? You know, I don't, I don't know what, what I'm supposed to make that lid look like. Can you give me some more parameters to how this thing goes? Like, how long should the wingtips be? Uh, what should the face look like? Like a human face? I mean, if you read Ezekiel, some of those angels seem like, what? It's not what I would picture. And so he's got to make two power angels. He said, he said to Moses, do it exactly like I tell you. It's got to look like what's in heaven. You're making a copy. But he doesn't have a Xerox of what an angel looks like. He's got, they don't have a Polaroid. He has nothing. He's just got to create this. How would you like that job? Make me the thing that we're going to use where God's going to live in it. And it needs to be exactly like heaven and you have no other details other than that. Here's the wild thing about God. Here's what's so amazing about God. God said, my spirit will be in him. My spirit is in him. He's already got it in him to do this task. I've equipped him to do this. God is so amazing in that we get to partner with him. He's putting stuff in our mind. He's putting thoughts in our head. And he's putting skill in our hands and in our mind. He, 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 he obviously does that. But there's an element of, I want to see what my child is going to come up with. I want to see. I've put this in him, but I want to see what he's going to come up with. I think that's awesome. 
God gets finished making all the animals. And then he, instead of just saying, name, 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 he takes them to Adam, lines them all up like Noah's Ark, and says, name it, name it, name it, name it. And he wants to know what his child is going to call it. Isn't that cool? Our God interacts with us. He speaks to us, yes. He works through us, yes. But there is a part to you that is him that he made. He knit you together in your mother's womb and deep calls out to deep. What's deep in you calls to what's deep in him and creative process gets started. And, and, he, and he loves that. He loves that. Don't you? If you're a parent, isn't it cool when your kid brings something home from school? You just want, you know, you plaster it out, you put it up, you put it on Facebook, and be like, well, that's not that great. It is to me. You know, like, you, I love it. And, but they make that, but they get better. And at some point, they, they, there's something that, that is calling out to them, and they're actually getting really good at it. When I listen to my son or my daughter sing and play music, I love it. They write music to the Lord. My daughter writes poetry and then acts it out. And I watch it and go, how do you even think to do that? Like, it's just fascinating to me. They can do things I can't do, and I watch it, and I go, wow. And that's my kid. That's how God feels. Bezalel, make the angels. Oh, why? Like what? Like whatever comes to mind. Don't do it flippantly. Pray about it. Take the materials I give you and operate with the spirit that I put in you and start creating. It's okay. You're going to figure this out. You're going to figure it out. Just start. I, to me, I think that's magnificent. The first time I came in here and I looked at how it was constructed, I knew God was behind it. I knew. For one, someone put a bathroom and a shower in my office. Had to be God. Brilliant. But the first time I walk in, not even knowing anything but just being a guest, because I'm going to be, you know, I'm being looked at as a pastor. I come in, and I see the fireplace and the couches and people sitting and talking in the little cafe and the place where the children are. It's like this one central hub, but it's like super conducive to conversation. And that's what happens every Sunday. Like people, uh, unfortunately, sometimes it happens during the service. People are like, eh, you're talking it up out there on the couches. <laughs> so like, I try to hear the, but you know, it's super conducive to conversation. All week long, there's someone here doing something, or, or maybe even daycare having lunch, but everybody comes to the couches. And when it's cold, you just start the fire. You just, I mean, I can't beat a, a push button fire. And you just sit there and there's a piece to it. Right, Ryan? You bring your work here a couple days a week. Just this is peaceful. God's here. Yes. And, and, and you come and read before we meet. It's, just, it's like God's here. It's worth being here. But just the, the, the design of it. People come in and go, oh, wow, the sanctuary is so cool. I used to bowl here. And I lo just love what was happening. God was in it. God gave plans to architects, <laughs> thoughts to the builders, and they put this together. Out of nothing, out of a bowling alley. The Walmart in St. Pete was brilliantly constructed. What they did with it was fantastic. God did that. He used the gifts and talents of the body and his spirit within them and then said, okay, here's kind of how I want it, but I'd love to see what you come up with. And allows them to create. Amen. When I write a song and I'm working on music, and, and the song kind of comes out of me. I know God's given it to me, but I know there's a measure of what I want to do with it. When I write a sermon, I, I just pray and pray and I wait for him. And he gives me, he gives me points that I know are from him. I just, it wasn't even in my head. I'm like, oh my gosh, we light something up in the scripture. But there's a certain amount of, now let me see what you do with it. He does that with all of us. Whatever you do, whatever God's gifted you to do, in the body and outside of it, there's a measure of creativity that he loves to watch what his children are going to come up with. And that is precious. That's how involved he is. Bezalel's never been like Paul to the third heaven. He's, he's never been 
in God's presence in a way that he would see the cherubim, and yet God uses what he makes, and he keeps it there for almost 900 years. We're called to build by faith. We're called to walk by faith. We, we're called to, to take step by step by step by faith. I'm sure as he was making it and constructing, he's praying, God, help me. Help me do this the way you want it done. I do that when I'm with a message. I do that all the time. I do it constantly. I want to say only what you want said. I don't want to just say something that came out of my head. Uh, anything that we do, anything that we're called to do, step by step, trusting him that he's going to show you where to go with it. Ministries built from nothing like Samaritan's Purse, Salvation Army, stuff that's come up and affected the, the, the globe, the planet, in ministry, has come because God put it on someone's heart, gave them a measure of creativity, and Salvation Army is like, well, I don't know, a brass band, I guess? <laughs> you know, we'll, we'll, that'll be our calling card as a, as a brass band, and we want to give to the poor, and that's how they get started. We'll kind of take some bar songs and flip them around into praise songs. He's always taken pagan gold and turning it into something holy. He's always doing it. And this is the other thing. We're called to build things that are copies of what's in heaven. We're called to that. He says to Moses, pay attention. I want you to build things exactly the way I tell you because it's a copy of what's in heaven. He does that for us. You know, you hear a song that really ministers to you, it's because the Holy Spirit's in it. He's speaking through it to you. You see artwork that just, something about it speaks to you. It's because the Holy Spirit's in it. If you're feeling the peace of God where you are, it's because the Holy Spirit's in it. But so much more than just these things. We think, we think in terms of those types of gifts. But you can sense when God is in an event put on by Barbara and her team. You can sense it. Like, wow, this was, this was super well done and creative and thoughtful. I lo sometimes you'll tell me the reason you did what you did. And I'm like, wow, that's really cool. The charcuterie board goodbye to Lori Reynolds was a brilliant. That, that was above and beyond. We have these things that God calls us to and then he works within us and through us and says, now let me see what you're going to do with it. And it's beautiful. Yeah. We have another church that was a, was a uh, uh, movie theater. Yeah, yeah. We, we've turned a lot of things into churches. Here's another thing. We're called to build a temple in which Christ lives by his spirit. We're called to do it. We're not called just to be it, because we are. We're called to do it, to build a temple in which God can live by his spirit. We're called to that. They're building on the desert floor a curtain based tabernacle that is mobile, movable. You can take it up, tear it, you can take it up, tear it down, take it up, tear it down, and move it to wherever you're going. It's this mobile church. They have, they have built it out of nothing. Well, they've built it out of Egypt's old stuff, and they've built it on a desert floor, and yet, wherever they are is where God's presence is. That's where the pillar and fire is. That's where the Shekinah glory is. That's where God is. And the whole world around them can see that these people know God by what they built. We're called to build it. In that same section in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, say this. This, is, this follows up exactly where he was. Hey, if you build with these materials, they'll burn up. If you build with these materials, that will hold, they'll stand the test of time, test of fire. But the next couple verses say, don't you know, Paul talking to the Corinthians, don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple, and that God's spirit dwells in your midst? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy that person, for God's temple is sacred. And you together are that temple. We're not made, and we're not meant, to do anything to destroy that. 
Gossip destroys it. Backbiting destroys it. Selfish ambition destroys it. Trying to rat race to the position that you want at church destroys it. Just moving with God and moving in the gifts that we have and, and, and praying all the way and doing things carefully but doing things uh, prayerfully. We're going to build something that will that'll last. It will be by faith. It will be with costly stones and gold and silver It'll be something that tells the world around, this is a place that God is. This is a touch point where you can see God. And more than anything else, it's us. We're the mobile tabernacle that God lives in that no matter where we go and set up and go and set up and go and set up at this workplace, at that play place, at, at, at this party, at this fellowship, at that Bible study, we are that tabernacle. And together we're that tabernacle. And we're not meant to do anything to destroy it. It's why, it's why Sunday, when I was sharing on forgiveness, it's why it's so valuable to God. The whole kingdom's based on forgiveness. We've got no business in the kingdom if we hadn't been forgiven. The whole thing's based on forgiveness. We have got to move towards each other in that way. We've got to have grace for each other. We have to have love for each other. It has to be there. But when it's there... The world sees Christ. They will know that we're here by our love. They'll know. Did I even read any of this chapter? All right, let me, let me read a little bit of the chapter. We read the ark. The table. He's building the table now. Where they're going to put the show bread. The 12 for every tribe. God saying, I am the bread of life. Jesus. They made the table of acacia wood, two cubits long, a cubit wide, and a cubit and a half high. And then they overlaid it with pure gold and made a gold molding around it. They also made around it a rim, a hand breadth wide, and put a gold molding on the rim. They cast four gold rings for the table and fastened them to the four corners where the four legs were. The rims were put close to the rim, the rings, rather, were put close to the rim to hold the poles used in carrying the table. No touchy. The poles for carrying the table were made of acacia wood and were overlaid with gold also. And they made from, they were made, whew, they made from pure gold the articles of the table. It's plates, dishes, bowls, pitchers for the pouring of the drink offerings. The lampstand. They made the lampstand of pure gold. They hammered out its base and shaft. Notice the they now, not just Bezalel. Bezalel is now sharing the Spirit of God that he has with others, teaching them what he wants done, and they're doing it. He's, he's discipling. He's saying, do it like this. This is what God showed me. This is what Moses told me because he spoke to God. This is what I feel like this is the way that God wants it done. Now I'm handing it off to you and you and you. You build the base. You build the shaft. We're going to put it all together in one piece. They made the lamp stand of pure gold. They hammered out its base and shaft and made its flower-like cups, buds, and blossoms of one piece with them. Six branches extended from the sides of the lamp stand, three on one side, three on the other. Three cups shaped like almond flowers with buds and blossoms were on one branch, three on the next branch, and the same for all six branches extending from the lampstand. And on the lampstand were four cups shaped like almond flowers with buds and blossoms. One bud was under the first pair of branches extending from the lampstand, a second bud under the second pair, and a third bud under the third pair, six branches in all. The buds and the branches were all one piece with the lampstand, hammered out of pure gold. Remember, it was so important. I've mentioned this before, but just as a reminder, it was so important that it was one piece only. It was these three branches on both sides and a light in the middle, all of one piece. It had to be one piece because the six branches make the number of man. They're one with Christ in the center, and it's all made of gold. It's all deity, and it's all producing fruit. And it's all what Jesus says in John 14 and 15, abide in me and you'll bear fruit. You've got to be one with me and you'll bear fruit. It's the whole thing is representative. It's just like it is in heaven. It's the plan coming forward and you've got to build it this way. But how big should the almonds be? I don't know. Make it your way. How big should the 
the, the buds be under the, how long should the branches be? God just, God just lays that out. I want to see what you come up with. But make sure that these things are in place. They made it seven lamps as well as wick trimmers and trays of pure gold. They made the lampstand and all its accessories from one talent. One talent. 75 pounds of pure gold. The altar of incense. They made the altar of incense out of acacia wood. It was square, a cubit long, a cubit wide, and two cubits high. Its horns of one piece with it. They overlaid the top and all the sides, the horns with pure gold, and they made a gold molding around it. They made two gold rings below the molding, two on each of the opposite sides, to hold the poles used to carry it. They made the poles of acacia wood and overlaid them with gold. They also made the sacred anointing oil and the pure fragrant incense, the work of a perfumer. Again, all gifts and talents that God had put in Bezalel to show others how to do. Like any one of these things he can do, the scripture says. He's just showing people how. But a lot of these things, they've already learned how to do in 450 years of slave, slavery and servitude for Egyptians who like all this stuff. They would have to make it for them. So they've been trained and trained and trained and trained how to make wicked cool stuff. And then when it comes time for them to do it for their God, they know. But Bezalel is like the key. He's got God's spirit in him. I want it done like this. It's crucial because what you see happening, what they're building right now, is everything in the holy place and the most holy place. As soon as God inhabits it, it's now not touchable. As soon as God inhabits it, you better use the poles and the sticks and the rings. Don't just walk in there touching it. God's spirit will be there in such a potent way that everyone's not allowed unless you're a priest. Which again is why it's so crucial that in 1 Peter it says we are a kingdom of priests. We have that access. We have that access to the holy place, to the most holy place. I've had access to the most holy place in my car. Just tears coming down my face because of something God spoke to my heart as I'm just sitting there praying. I've had, I've had access to the mo most holy place in the shower as God just went and blew something into my mind that I knew was only from him. I've had access to the most holy place in the middle of the worst chaos when he spoke something to me to keep me from overreacting to something that I was just ready to do. We have the Holy Spirit inside of us. The most holy place lives here. And if we are willing to look to interact with this king, we're going to build things at last. We're going to build holy things. We're going to build by faith. We're going to build disciples. And when the fire comes, it'll stand that test. It'll stand it. Because that fire we just went through a little while ago, that won't be the only fire. God constantly tests his work. Just like I said before, I'll come out of a service and I will be challenged immediately. Or something will happen in my life that will represent something that God spoke through me. So he's validating what's good, but he's also challenging what's good. Like, that's good, but you need to do it too. Yeah. Don't ever just say it. He'll challenge it. So this is what I'm going to ask. I really, tonight, I felt like um, one of the things that we literally build towards, because building takes effort. Building is you're actually going to move. You're gonna, it's going to take some effort on your part. And one of the things that gets built, one of the things that, that, we, that we purposefully do and work towards in building a place of worship is having an atmosphere that's perfect for it, building the atmosphere for it, meaning taking your thoughts off other things, letting God be first, moving towards him purposefully in your heart and mind and not letting something else distract you to the best of your ability. Focus on the words. You're just building an atmosphere where the Holy Spirit can easily communicate. 
and I want to I wanna worship a little more. After we do, there's not a ton of us. It would be amazing if we just, just prayed together yeah. like we do. Just pray together. Again, building the atmosphere of worship and prayerfully moving forward. But I just feel like if we go back to the worship first, it'll help set the table. You willing to just do that with me? We've got, I've stopped early on purpose. We've got time. Uh, we normally finish at 7.30. It's like 7.03. So I'd like to just spend a little bit more time in worship. It can be any psalm that you pick. We can just run with it. Rather than, we can duplicate what we did, or we can just run with something new. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be curious how you do this. Right. I'm going to be curious how you build this. I'm excited to see. Amen. I'm going to build with you, but I'm, I'm excited to see how this is going to go. You've got open, wide open parameters. <laughs> it isn't. The Holy Spirit is inside of her to make these choices.